Good morning and welcome to The Review, the Instagram live podcast where Kanama news and culture is shared over the warmth of coffee. Today, Jake Weens, the co-founder of Grain Theory and father to the Ken Garden and MC of all your favorite Kendama events, joins me to talk through the early grind of getting GT off the ground and moving, what it's like to play Kendama at the age of 37, and the fourth cup, the best method of staying caffeinated at your favorite Kendama events. I'm really excited for this conversation today. This one's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we get to nerd out about coffee all the time. Uh, and we're going to be talking about some really cool stuff. Really excited to have Jake on here. I think that it's a cool unity of coffee and kendama on the review. The whole reason that this podcast got started in the first place. Before we get too deep though, as usual, I want to know down in the chat what you guys are drinking this morning as you join the review. Let me know. I am drinking a really nice cup of Burundi from Rosso Coffee Roasters here in Calgary, Alberta. Um, I highly recommend that you pick up some of these in particular if you like a fruity and acidic coffee. This is absolutely fantastic. Uh, it has kind of a grapefruity note to it right when you first sip it, that kind of fruity coffee flavor. Now, and that kind of sounds weird if you don't know anything about coffee to say it's fruity. But what that means is it's acidic, uh, generally speaking, and it just carries real deep and real nice into the back of your throat. I'm a big fan of it. Uh, in a couple of moments here, we're going to get Jake on here uh, talking about coffee, talking about these things. But uh, as you're letting me know what you're drinking this morning down in the chat, uh, a few cool announcements. This weekend's kind of huge. Uh, this weekend is the Kendama World Cup. If you've been sleeping for the past 24 hours, we've just gone through the qualifying rounds and we're down to, I think, what, the top 30 or 40 people that are moving on to the second round of qualifiers where they're going to be competing to move on to the final eight. Uh, it's pretty crazy. There's some stiff competition out there and the highest scoring KWC uh, that we've ever seen so far. Now, partly that might be because it's easier tricks or tricks that have been practiced before because they're from years prior. But nonetheless, it's quite the feat. Uh, secondly, if you're in the Calgary or Alberta area, uh, one thing to know is that we're hosting a jam this afternoon at 1 o'clock p.m. down in Riley Park. We're going to have a little bit of a unity of Calgary and Edmonton there. So that's really exciting. And then lastly, one little secret note. I'm not going to give away too much here, but you might want to mark down in your calendars September 1st for Brevue. Uh, something cool is coming out that I and some of my friends are really, really excited for uh, that we can't wait to share with you guys. But that will come a little bit later and you will know more about that soon. Okay, let's see what you guys are drinking down in the chat. Uh, Tomo Dama is drinking a Colombian with his Kalita. Okay, rock on. Kalitas are nice. Oh, Chad coming to, yeah, 40. There were 40. Red Bull with that Norks Fuel from AJ Kandama. Mac Kandama's drinking his vanilla protein shake. Uh, he's wishing he had coffee. Absolutely. Kandama's caffeinated and ready. Gucci Moon Boots is drinking some Peace Coffee Birchwood Light Roast French Press. I love it. Bish in the chat uh, is drinking Mothership Coffee roasted in Las Vegas with that French Press Froth. I love it. There's so much in here. Drew Manchu always with his Mountain Dew. Uh, Caterade with peppermint tea and Duncan and official D purchase with his pour over from a local coffee shop and Chad with the Costa Rica AeroPress again. There's so many more in here. I can't go through all of them because we need to get Jake in here shortly uh, and I'm going to send him and let's kick off this week's review. We'll just wait for him to jump in here. <sighs> Guys, I'm very excited for this. To just nerd out about coffee. Also, I always drink a Perrier in the morning with my coffee because you got to have a little bit of water in your diet. Jake Yo. Weems, welcome here, man. We made it. I had to get in full fourth cup gear. Oh, I love it. I love the attire. To make it official. Dude, is that, a, is that a fourth cup apron? This is actually, yeah, it's a fourth cup apron. I have a little... Uh, 3D printed caliper that I actually sewed onto it. So got what? my flex there. You know, this is the barbecue and coffee. It's all the best things. I love that so much. Oh, man, <laughs> I need to get myself an apron. I feel like my like coffee. I I think you are way ahead of me when it comes to coffee in terms of how over the top you go with style and personality and everything. I'm trying to catch up to that. That's my goal. I'm trying to work Dude, on that. 
that's the barista performance, man. That's half the attraction of coffee is the dance. It's the showmanship. Um, <laughs> it's 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 one of the things that completely inspired Fourth Cup was like that fantasy of like actually like being a badass barista and like smacking stuff around and hitting grinders and blowing beans off your tamper and like going in. So oh, I but love I that. I'm making something today because I'm already on my third cup. Oh, you're ahead of me. And, I'm uh, just on cup number two right now. So yeah, I've already I've, I've already had like full Chemex from this morning, and uh, so yeah, we're gonna be doing. I'm not sure if you guys can see, but. We're going to be doing a little hand-pressed espresso shot here. Awesome. Awesome. This is usually the, the, the afternoon go-to. So Right on. Well, Jake, thank you so much for being here today. Really excited for this episode of The Review. As I've mentioned Absolutely. over and over again, I'm a huge coffee fan, and I've been dying to have you on here so we can nerd out a little bit about coffee. <laughs> but we're also going to be talking a little bit about Kendama and GT and what it's like for you to play Kendama at the age of 37 with a family. And I'm, I'm genuinely really interested in what that's like because – I mean, I'm not that old yet, but I'm, I'm approaching the latter half of my 20s and it's getting harder and harder on my knees. And I just want to know. I want to know what I'm looking forward to in a few years. But, oh, the um, later half of my 20s. <laughs> <laughs> um, as we dive in, though, I like to ask three questions to every single guest that comes on, uh, yeah. partly for consistency, but partly because I think it's just fun. Uh, first off, what's your favorite way to drink coffee? Well, it's changed now. It, it used to be AeroPress, and now it is Chemex. And mm -hmm. my favorite way to drink coffee is just, like, out on our back patio here, out on our back porch, just having coffee alone, no music, just chilling with outdoor sounds and having one to four cups of coffee. <laughs> yeah, I get that. But How definitely many Chemex. Chemex became my favorite quickly. Uh, because like I could hone it in, I got to where I could hone in that practice, and I could have two cups back to back. Where AeroPress, I had it extremely honed in, mm -hmm. but sometimes I would have to go back and make another one. And I was like, ah. mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I used to do Chemex a lot uh, when I had a roommate that would drink coffee with me because we'd make you know uh, a double batch of it because you could do two at one time and then we could both share yeah. the same cup. Uh, or the same brew. But now I've gotten back into AeroPress because I typically just make one cup for myself and then I'll make another one a couple hours later and then move move on that way. Absolutely. That's awesome. So do you have other brewing methods that you do you use? So, well, you got the French press. Well, no, this is actually, it's called a Star So this is like an Amazon oh, farm. I remember asking you about this actually months and months ago because yeah. I saw this on your your post. Oh my goodness. So, so like, this is like a hand-pressed espresso, right? Yeah, it's a hand-pressed espresso. It does a pretty good job. Um, it definitely gives you that crema froth top. Yeah. Um, so the other ways is definitely this is an afternoon coffee. And the other thing that I've been getting into, and some people might talk, talk, talk some smack about it, but, like, I've been researching instant coffees and, like, getting – trying to find the best instant coffee. Oh. And because – Man, there's some times where I've been grinding as dad, designing yeah. everything, and I'm just like, I need a coffee, but I'm too lazy right now to do any of the preferred yeah. methods. So, wah, instant. Okay. Let's go. Uh, for sure, yeah. after this episode, I, I can't remember it right now, but I have a buddy who like is a coffee blogger in the city here and knows a whole bunch of brands, and he he will die on on recommending this one instant coffee. He says it's the best instant coffee you can find. So I'll I'll make sure I catch it up. I'll send you that your oh. way. Dude, okay, uh, other two questions. We got sidetracked. Uh, Dama-related questions. What's your favorite Kendama player and your favorite Dama trick? Last three questions before we dive into the meat of this. Okay, favorite Kendama player? Dang, like, I got to say, like, right now it's Tio. Mm. It, it, it always changes. I also just spent, like, well, a long time getting Tio's release ready, working with him on the mod, and just, like, seeing his play style and the way he's, like, going... Oh, we got a little bit of lag here. So, like, the, the way he's going, like, <laughs> sorry, we're back? All okay, right, cool. Yeah, uh, so, you're good, yeah. Okay, so the way kind of, like, going in his direction, but, like, pushing his style has just been really awesome. So, definitely, right now is Tio. Favorite Kendama trick still is just, I'm addicted to, like, simple spacewalk one turns. Mm. I have this vision of, like, trying to, like, make the golden ratio with a spacewalk one turn. So like, because if, if you were to map out a spacewalk one turn, it can form the golden ratio. So I'm always like, I call it chasing huh. the ratio, but. That's cool. 
I expect an edit, an edit of that at some point. I think oh, that'd be aesthetically beautiful. That's definitely one of the things I want to make. So. Awesome. Well, uh, we're going to dive into the meat of the conversation. I see this kind of breaking down in three functions. Uh, one, we'll talk a little coffee. Uh, we'll talk yeah. a little bit about the fourth cup. Uh, we'll move a little bit into GT and how that yeah. all got started. And then lastly, uh, we'll touch on uh, what it's like to play Dom at 37 with a family and still yet traveling the world and having a great impact on the community. Um, sure. As we dive into that, I want to remind those of you in the chat that if you have questions that you want asked throughout the episode, make sure you put them in the Q&A tool. That's that little box at the bottom with a question mark. And I'll be sure to ask Jake as many of those as I can throughout the episode. Uh, and secondly, if you just want to add some comments to the chat or interact with others, that's what the comment section is for. I love seeing those come in, but if you want questions asked, put them in the Q&A tool. So Jake, let's dive into this. I, I am so curious. And before we dive in, I'll actually tell a, a brief little story um, of when I think I first ran into you, which was MKO18. Um, yeah. I, I want to know about the fourth cup specifically a little bit, but uh, here's a little story. When I showed up to MKO18, that was my very first Kendama event. And you were there in the lobby with your full out stand brewing coffee for people. And, and, and back then, I was like moderately into coffee, like getting deeper and deeper into the specialty coffee scene. But I was still intimidated to come up and ask for a cup of coffee from you. But I just like stood back and watched you for like minutes and minutes and minutes. And I don't think I actually ever ended up or by the time I ended up asking you, I think you were sold out of beans uh, and you were <laughs> out. And I was so sad because I missed out on a J Queen's handcrafted uh, cup of coffee. But outside of that, tell me a little bit of the story of the fourth cup. What is the fourth cup and how did it came to life? So the, the fourth cup came from just like my, first of all, I enjoy coffee. And second of all, it's like, I'm always during live events, the, the booth aspect to me is always such a big thing that I enjoy doing. So it's the presentation, which speaking mm -hmm. of presentation, I'm just going to give you guys a little view of this presentation. of flaw. Yes. So there's the crema that, that comes out of. Mm. Uh, so. Oh, that's a good crema too. So that's going to be my coffee during the interview. I love this. Got to start off with that. So uh, it came from wanting to bring something to the presentation aspect of a booth. Instead of it just being like a booth where it's Kendama is what we have, I wanted to add something extra. And I had already had this fantasy of like owning a coffee shop. And I, I like, I'm like a little mm. kid playing pretend every time I make coffee. And so I was like, I'm going to make coffee for everybody. I'm just going to do it. I got a French press. I got an Aero press. I got a Star Esso. And I got two tea kettles. So mm. let's try this. And the first time I did it was at Dama and the D. And I got to just play barista and it was just mad fun. And through that, I discovered kind of maybe a subconscious reason for it is like, whenever I'm up there making coffee and you're able to actually see the process of it and see how much time mm -hmm. and like care goes into the individual cup, my goal and my thought was that's going to relate over to my designs with my products with grain theory. So like whenever you're sitting there and you're watching me like, make this coffee and I'm grinding the beans, adjusting the grinder, making it to where exactly what you want. And I'm making the coffee and I'm talking about Kendama mm. and, and our Kendamas. It kind of, and in my mind had this like really interesting crossover because like how much attention we put into our Kendamas is, and then good, but, but you can't really see the process of that. So I'm showing a process of coffee and the detail in that and talking about the Kendamas. And there's that kind of like mental overlap that happens. So mm -hmm. that was a really fun part about it. And then I just kept going with it, so. That's cool. So obviously you see, and I think I, I see it as well, an overlap of culture between coffee and kendama, yeah. where where there's a uniqueness of craftsmanship that goes into both of them. And and so uh, talk to me about your perspective on, on how coffee and kendama relate, because I think I have my own perspective that people have heard from the preview episodes, but, but what about you? Where, so, where did you get into coffee? And was it a similar journey like Kendama? Kind of. I didn't really drink coffee until I started going to university in San Francisco. And even then, it was just like, just need coffee to stay awake and finish this mm -hmm. project, you know? And uh, when did I really start getting into it? It was probably like 
whenever I moved to, well, it started with a French press. A French press was my first like craft condom maker, yeah. condom maker, coffee maker. And then from there it was like, oh, how else can you do this? So it, that's kind of the correlation. It's like, if you have this like personality aspect where it's like you dive into things. Mm -hmm. So for instance, like you're into photography, I'm into photography. I get into that. I just start diving into all the mm -hmm. gear and all the styles. Um, Kendama, obviously get a Kendama. Ooh, there's this one, there's that one, there's this trick, there's that trick. It's the same exact thing for coffee because there's so many different individuals that are applying their take on it. So creating different ways of brewing, uh, different blends, different styles of roasting, different origins of beans. And it's just, it's a, a, a vast var a variety of different styles. And it's similar with Kendama, where there's so many different styles of play, so many different styles of equipment and Kendamas and Kendama players that mm -hmm. it's really easy to dive into. Yeah, and, and with that then, so do you, do you see any of your learnings and your growth in the coffee or the specialty coffee world carrying over into your craftsmanship of Kendamas, particularly with GT? Where do you see the overlap of your learnings there into photography or into to the other, other elements of your life? Totally, I mean, well, for me, a lot of my writing too, so all the descriptions and a lot of the copywriting is, is mine. And I've always been really inspired by the way people describe uh, coffee, beer, wine, spirits. Mm -hmm. Like you read the back of those bottles and it's just like a poem of mm -hmm. how, it, because I was thinking about this too. Yeah, because taste and smell are two things you can't communicate through the internet, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like, you have to find a way to say like, to describe to you how this tastes and how it smells through words and audio and visual. And so for me, coffee really kind of, and the way they, they uh, uh, present coffee really taught me a lot on how to present kendamas. Even though it's like a kendama, you can't, I mean, you see it, it doesn't really have it. You don't taste a kendama. Mm -hmm. But uh, especially with walnut though, walnut has a beautiful smell. So whenever we mm -hmm. release our walnuts, I really focus on the smell of this because you're adding mm -hmm. a, a, an, another sense to yeah. this item. And that's something that coffee really taught me was like, yeah, dive into, use your words, use a, like, uh, I said, use your words. I'm so used to saying that with I, I'm like, I like use your words, <laughs> use your words. So, but using words and language to communicate something that might not be able to be experienced through this internet platform is something mm -hmm. that coffee really taught me. Interesting. Yeah, I've always found that so unique, especially with coffee. And like, it depends on the type of coffee you buy. If you're buying Walmart coffee or whatever, you're not going to get this on the bags. But but you get a narrative whenever you buy like a specialty coffee bag, 100%. where it's not only telling you the origin of where it came from, it's not only telling you what it tastes like, but it, it's also giving you these random details that come together to create this narrative that you get to partake in as you drink it. So for, for example, like this, this coffee that I'm drinking this morning, I don't even know how to pronounce this properly, but Businde, uh, it's a CWS, it's from Burundi, from the, the Kayanza province, and it's a natural red bourbon. And this thing is really acidic, really fruity and floral, yeah. and, and it carries all these notes. And I, I can attribute that to that place in the world because that's the place in the world in which you get those things. And it's almost as, like, it's almost as though I get to participate in it in a unique way. Similar yeah. to, I think, Kendama as well, especially with the GT story, how you guys invite people into a deeper sense with the Kendama. Like, I don't know if it, down to the spectra plies that you guys are crafting, like there's mm -hmm. a narrative that's deeper than just a Kendama. And I'm really interested in hearing some of that perspective as we jumped into GT conversation. But, but with coffee, what for you draws you deeper? Um, it's, the, it's the ritualistic aspect of it. It's the wake up every morning make coffee, start that process. And it's so something else that coffee has taught me, it, it's carried over into food and just almost a lot of different aspects of life is like, if there's something you do every single day, like enjoy it. For instance, food, you eat it three times a day, or you should. And uh, why not get really good at making food? It's something you're going to do every day for the rest of your life. Is mm -hmm. eat food. So why not learn about it and know about it. It's, and then for me, it was with coffee. It's like, I'm gonna do this every morning, sometimes all day, depending on the project. <laughs> so it's like, why mm -hmm. not know as much about it as I can? Um, and why not enjoy it, you know? You, mm -hmm. I, 
I, I try and take every aspect of my life and turn it into something enjoyable. Um, hmm. Wow. Through that, you're going to find it's going to improve your mood and it's going to just, you're just going to have more fun with daily life. Like stuff that, I mean, most people come downstairs and put a coffee on a pot and then go and do something else. But if you just actually take that time to make that coffee, you're going to feel more rewarded for it. And you're going to carry that vibe into the rest of your day. It's like with the, with the lookbook that I just did for the GT winter line or summer line, excuse me, it opens up with the French press and me making coffee. And the whole concept was that like, you start your day with a process, right? And you, and you finish that process and you see it through. And after you've made your coffee, this is the representation of the process you just finished. And you carry that directly into your work. That's why most people mm. make their coffee, carry their cup, sit down at their desk. Because really? it is that continuation of that momentum. Um, and that's something that keeps you moving with it. Yeah, it's like you get to enter yourself into a state of flow. I don't know if you're like familiar with like Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, the the psychologist. He talks all about flow. No, I'm not familiar with him, but I know state of flow. So. Yeah, yeah. So he's the guy who like coined flow. He was the one who wrote the and did the research on it originally. And he's all about like finding activities that stimulate a flow state for you. And for me, that's 100% coffee in the morning. It's that methodical repetition that is crafted that I get to carry into whatever my next activity is. So I love what you just said, because that I think hits so hard. And for those of you listening, whether oh, it's by podcast or by live, like think about that in your own life of ways that you can stimulate a place of flow that carries into your other activities, whether or not it's work, kendama, coffee, family, play, doesn't matter what it is, but getting yourself into those states is gonna carry forward so strongly into the rest of your activities. 100%. That said, oh man, I could talk about coffee for a while. I, I want to hit a couple of quick questions for you uh, before we move on to a little bit of a GT conversation. Some from the chat uh, and some that were submitted ahead of time. Um, a couple guys were asking, and I think it's a broad question, and I don't know if there's a strong answer that any true coffee lover can give, but what's your favorite roast? Or maybe I, I would ask it differently. Where, what's your favorite origin for coffee? Origin is definitely Ethiopian. Okay, I'm why? Ethiopian fan. So like... I just like the, the, the way it, it, it has a, it's a light roast, first of all. Well, for, for the Ethiopian that I get. And sure. yeah. also it's just, I don't know how to explain it. It's, it, it kind of transcends between like, a, it, it's a lighter and like it's texture, but also it like fills your mouth up. It hits like back here a little bit different and mm. it's like, it's 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 more citrusy the the berry notes and everything in it are like what i like mm -hmm. now so and again mm -hmm. it always shifts back and forth like i'm also the guy to be like oh there's a shitty gas station let's go get some <laughs> some gas station coffee because yeah. it has its own appeal when you're on a road trip like, oh, it 100 percent does i want a styrofoam cup with some whatever burnt no, actually anything but burnt coffee I, yeah. one thing i can't do is burnt coffee it can be the weakest coffee in the world i'll still be like oh but it's gas station coffee we're on a road trip and it and, just uh, hits right, right? Yeah, it hits right. But at home, it's it's an Ethiopian origin bean, a lighter roast. And uh, I really enjoy the coffee from Newport, which is up here in Evanston, Illinois. So Awesome. Uh, personally, I love anything African. I love the fruitier mm -hmm. coffees. I kind of like stay mostly away from South, South American stuff. I don't love the nuttier coffees. Like, they're smooth, yeah. but they're not fun for me. Like, they're not yeah. exotic. Uh, but anyways, I could talk more about my own love, uh, but there's a lot of people that have questions. So I want to ask a few of them. Uh, okay, here we go. We got one from bat ball and stick, uh, or bat at ball and stick. What's your favorite coffee place? I'm imagining it's the one you just mentioned. Well, yeah, right now it's Newport coffee here in Evanston. Um, it's a beautifully designed spot. They've got great coffee They're The layout of their spot is really nice. And it's a spot that before COVID I would go and work and uh, they have stand-up tables so i could stand up and work which was so clutch for me mm. so newport coffee here in evanston cool uh, carter justice asked i'm thinking about getting a chemex i have a french press now what are the pros of a chemex do you want to give him a reason why he should buy chemex yeah so with it's, it's two different styles of brewing the french press you're going to go coarse ground longer like initial steep is like a batch and mm -hmm. then you're going to push your beans down through your water. And that's going to leave you with your coffee. Um, I always found it to be much more uh, for the French press. 
it's much of a lighter taste. It's not as full. And with a Chemex, you go a little bit more fine and you can really kind of hone in your, your drip your, because you're just pouring the water through the beans. So you're going to get a much more robust, flavorful cup from a Chemex. Mm, yeah, mm -hmm. I, honestly, I don't even mess with French press anymore. Every time I make a French press, I'm like, either I'm doing this wrong or I just don't like it. So uh, Yeah, I know that there's a few people out there, even like professional coffee brewers that still hold true to, to French press and they'll advocate for it. But I always find that I get a dirty cup whenever I do it. And a dirty cup yeah. as in like it's grainy and I get grit through it. Maybe yeah. I'm just doing it wrong. But but there's some out there that live and die by it still. And they're they're quality brewers. Uh, okay, uh, Brett Walters or Boston W asked, "What's the best way to make iced coffee with his French press?" Another French press question, but maybe you got a quick, quick answer for him. I have no idea. I honestly don't. I, whenever iced coffee, it's on accident. It's a, it's a, it's a pot of coffee that's been sitting around, <laughs> and it's cold now, so I add ice and milk. Um, or I do, or cool. I, I've done cold brew ice, but. I've never really done much with a French press and iced coffee. So sorry, I don't have much insight on that. Cool. Okay, uh, two more questions and then we'll move on to a bit of the GT conversation. There's a lot of coffee questions in here, which is awesome. We can save yeah. them for the end. Um, Coach Moni asked, favorite process, washed or natural? Mm. Okay, I just went from a wash to a natural. So there's two Ethiopians from Newport. There's Ethiopian natural and this is Damo. And I don't, I mean, right, I keep going back to the Sadama, which is a wash. So I'm gonna have to say washed, hey, definitely. That's... I can't, I can't point out exactly why. Um, they both have different, I, I have to do a, a side by side. Cause usually it's like, I go through a whole bag of, of, yeah. of natural. And then it's like, I go back and they've got the Sadama in. So I get that one, but. Hey, well, maybe at your next live event, uh, we should host a cupping where people, mm. we, can, we can brew a couple, get a couple people in, do some reviewing. I think it could be a lot of fun. Yes. Uh, okay, last question. This one is from a close friend of yours, Haley Bischoff. She's asking, yes. Jake, remember the Froth Tour 2015, 2016? Anyways, what was your favorite part of the Froth Tour? And can we plan, and I can't read the rest of it, unfortunately, or can we okay. plan a Froth Tour Volume 2? So my, my favorite part about Froth Tour was just how loose it was. It's like, what, it was me, what is it? Okay, so it was me, Yord, and Haley. And we were the coffee nerds of, of the crew. And we always had our aero presses. And we were just called, any kind of coffee was called Froth. And we would just send <laughs> each other pictures of Froth. And uh, so we're like, oh, let's just do a tour together. And we're like, what do we call the tour? We're like, Froth Tour, why not? Uh, but so we did kind of all around the Bay Area. And my favorite part of it was just how loose and fun that tour was. It's like the name just set it to be like, what the Froth Tour doesn't make any sense. So we were able to kind of like just be crazy. But it, it did start every morning with, with making that coffee. Is there, the is there a YouTube series of it? Because I don't, I haven't. Done no, it. there's not. There's definitely some like flyers and images probably. Okay. Um, That's but, cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, and yes, there needs to be more froth tours. You know what? Uh, the froth challenge has started surfacing recently. Chad mm -hmm. Covington started tagging people in in his AeroPress shots in the morning and tagging yeah. people saying, "Froth challenge, you got 24 hours." So, uh, you know, those of you in the chat or on, on listening on podcast platforms, maybe go take a picture of your morning coffee. Start taking three friends and challenge them uh, to to brew their coffee yeah. and take a picture of their froth. Um, okay. <laughs> that said, uh, let's move to a little bit of the GT conversation. I know a lot of the people that are listening and tuning in want to know more about GT. GT has this really unique craftsmanship and, and almost like secrecy to the process. And, and, and it's kind of so enticing to me to want to know more. So I want to know first off, uh, and I think everybody wants to know is how did GT even start? What's the origin started, there? It just started from rice and i wanting to do something in california and it was just like at this point everything was china made and china was still learning how to make kendamas on this level like we kendama was evolving faster than china's manufacturing was able to like keep up with quality and precision mm. and so there was this moment where like a lot of the big companies would get batches and there would be a massive amount of them that were just unplayable because they were just so out of whack. And we were like, damn, this is like all a communication error. It's, it's communications, communication. So like, we want to make them in the US. 
And we spent a long time trying to figure it out. And then Rice was just like, hey, man, I'm starting this one way or another. You enter, you out. And I said, I'm in. Let's go. And so then my brother chimed in and was like, hey, I think we can make one because we could not find anyone to make it. Like we had raised some money. We had some cash. We had designs, everything. And no one, no, no one in the U.S. wanted to give us any time. So my mm -hmm. brother, Eric, and his buddies started RWB, which started making the first mm -hmm. American read GT Damas. And then it's just evolved from there. And it, it, it basically came from the uh, unwillingness to surrender in a sense and just be like, ah, oh, we're over it. Like if you try long enough, sometimes things just kind of come your way. And in this time, mm -hmm. and in this sense, uh, Eric and his homies totally met the call for making condoms in the US, so. Hmm. And so you originally partnered with RWB. Uh, and so where is that at now? Are you still working with RWB for no, manufacturing? So, so RWB dissolved a few years ago, actually. Okay, no way. I, and, have, uh, I have an RWB sitting somewhere in a box yeah. in my house. Yeah, like as a company, as a manufacturer, everything. Um, and so the manufacturing since then went to somebody else. And they've been learning, doing a great job, and they've just been crushing it with, with the production. Still run by Konama Player. And uh, so it's doing great. And we're continuing to push out stuff and create things to the scale that, 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 that we find acceptable. So totally. So yeah, you, you guys have a, a unique business model, from my understanding, in that you're partnered with Matt Rice, but you're on totally opposite ends of the country. Uh, where, it didn't start like that. We were both. So yeah, tell, tell me a bit started. about that. Yeah, that that that's just family family life moves. You know, it's like uh, Rice and I are both skate, bike. Sorry, just got a battery note. Um, so we're skate, bike, kendama homies, and uh, we started this thing, and then Rice has Leo, Rice and Andy have Leo, and in the Bay Area, it's kind of a, it's kind of problematic to have a, a, a child in the Bay because it's so expensive and schools are so competitive, mm -hmm. and it's just not very, like, middle class family friendly. Mm -hmm. So he moved to Portland and went up there, has this thing going there, and then I started my family and moved to Illinois, and so now we're here. And Rice handles uh, all the back end, all the shipping, all the incredibly fast shipping and packaging and mm -hmm. storing and ordering and stuff. And then I handle all things creative, visual, marketing, product design. So, cool. yeah, and it, it works out. Yeah, and, and you, so, so you're obviously in two different places and it's been working out now, but you originally were close to him. And when you started as GT, you were still playing for Kusa, is that correct? Yeah. So what's the story there a little bit from Kusa to GT and some of the overlap there? Because I imagine that that would have been a unique conversation uh, with the owner of Kusa uh, from having one of his own players start, up, start their own company. What was that like? I mean, yeah, yeah, this has been a question for a long time. Um, and it was just the goal was there was never going to be any competition because our Kandamas were USA made, $100, like mm -hmm. 130 at that time, too. And it wasn't really going to in, impose on the like $25, $30 Dama market. And it was just something where I was like, I'm just going to keep doing this. I'm going to be the owner of this and I'm going to be a pro for you. So like, if you go back during those times, like I personally never really promoted GT because I was a Kusa pro. And then it just got to a point where I just needed to go full GT because we needed to make some moves and it was no longer about being pro. It wasn't no longer about labels. It was about, family goals and mm -hmm. I needed to be able to accomplish my goals and I needed to make the move to go full GT so I can really go full towards my goals and that meant leaving Kusa. Yeah, and, and then there's something to be said about just having ownership over something rather than being, being not owned, but sort of being owned is that you had full creative freedom moving over to GT, especially as creative lead there. Mm -hmm. uh, and well, so like, was, yeah. and was that an incentive I, for you? Yeah, like I, I always had full, full creative freedom with GT, but this was, this allowed me, but I was also doing creative for Kusa. So this mm -hmm. allowed me to really streamline my ideas and just kind of like, all right, instead of going this, oh, who is this good for? It, it enabled me to streamline my creative process and therefore 
put more effort into projects that mattered. So, hmm. Hmm. so GT has been going now for a little while. You guys have obviously made a lot of changes. You've added some new members to your team recently. Mm -hmm. Teo's a huge addition. I love him so much. I love his style. <laughs> I think that was probably the, one of the best pickups of the year for a pro announcement. I'm stoked on that. Uh, what do you see as next for GT? Where is the progression of GT leading us? Uh, the progression of GT is, is we're about to do a lot of, we're about to make some moves that haven't been done in Kendama yet. And we're about to just kind of shake up Kendama hierarchy, I guess you could say, hmm. um, if that's a little hint. But I guess I just want to continue to m make Kendama related products that support out there for a second. Um, oh, yeah. So there. Yeah. Okay. So make Kendama related products that, that, that support the lifestyle and aren't necessarily like just make Kendamas, make Kendamas because to me, like I grew up skating, both of mm -hmm. us did Bryce and, Bryce and myself. And skating was all about, like, you have the shirt, you got the backpack. Like, so when you walk down the street, someone says, that guy skates. And if mm -hmm. somebody else that skates sees you, they say, yo, you skate. We're homies. And so we always modeled it after that. And so, for instance, like with GT Optics Co., uh, we're about mm -hmm. to come out uh, within this next week. We're about to come out with a 100-page photo book from our travels in Japan. Wow. So a physical photo book. Because... Um, I mean, it's terrible that this year no one's able to go to Japan. There's not going to be mm -hmm. any Japan videos, no traveling. So we really wanted to make something special. And last year, we made the decision to shoot no video in Japan, only photos. So that's where mm -hmm. Optics Co. Tour came. So it's just kind of like breaking out of the box with, with Kendama-related um, media products and designs and just continuing to do that. So wow. from... From new shapes to new designs to photo books to clothing lines to collections and uh, continuing to push in that direction. So, Wow. I think that's wonderful and amazing. And I think that's tapping into something that I think that the Kendama community needs. Uh, I think that you, you've hit it. And I think we're all beginning to see it now in the Kendama community that what we're actually missing is the behind the Ken stuff. The stories, mm -hmm. the narratives, the products, the, the other stuff that actually impacts Kendama from a content side that isn't just Ken's. We don't yeah. necessarily need more Kendamas. We have lots of them. I know that shapes can maybe always be improved and quality standards and those sorts of things. But I'm genuinely more interested in, in something like that. Like That's so cool. That impacts the branding of what we are and who we are so much more. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah, it, it just instills a for lack of a better term, like a vibe. Like whenever someone, yeah. I want, whenever somebody gets a GT, I want it to come with a feeling, you know? Yeah. And I want that feeling to be like this rush of like fourth cup and the fashion line. And when you get it and you hold it, you kind of have this feeling of like, dang, this, that, that's what this Kendama represents, you know? So, and just all the projects and products like kind of simmered down into that one kendama it's when you hold it you kind of get that 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 feeling so wow that is so cool i'm i'm just stoked on that in general as as someone who i think i think i can i can say now that i get to be this small contributor to this outside of ken space in the kendama community by doing these <laughs> podcasts and and i've even noticed an overwhelming response to this hosting something that isn't necessarily can relate it like I don't do any tricks on this I don't ask anyone to do any tricks and I don't even want that to be the thing because it's deeper that there's more to Kendama than just hitting bangers uh, of I course I I miss the days when like you and the Kusa squad or the sweets life those sorts of things those pieces of content that brought us into the lives of some of our favorite players not their mm -hmm. their tricks but into who they were and I think that that's so cool and I think a flip book like that brings me and brings whoever buys it into Japan I think so many of us oh, want that's to the goal, there. man. Dude, that, oh. that is the goal. And it, it and to us, and we went back and forth as far as like making it something di digital or making it something physical. And making it something physical was something that like you can, you can actually get sucked into and you can sit there and look at it, you know, take your time with it. And you can actually and enjoy it in a, 
in a physical state with your cup of coffee out on your patio in mm -hmm. your place of comfort. And it's not on a screen. It's something different. And that's what the, a Japan trip is. A Japan trip is a completely different experience than what you're used to. Um, you're, on the different, you're on the other side of the world, man. And you get off that plane and you don't understand anything. It's one of the most humbling, amazing experiences. And after going there 14 times, it's still unreal every time. And this is the first year that I'm not going to Japan. And uh, so we really wanted to do, to do something special. And that's where Damon, Adrian, and myself decided, let's make a book. And mm. it's almost done. Like we're literally like sending it to printers on Monday. And uh, wow. it's gonna be pretty awesome. Wow, that is cool. I love that idea. I love that product. And I love everything you guys put out. I don't think you guys have ever put out anything rushed nor lacking of quality. Uh, you guys are pretty, pretty intentional with making sure that everybody feels good when they buy a GT product. And the, uh, man, the price point, so I think, is said, so fair. I'm so, so happy to hear you don't think we put out anything rushed. <laughs> no. Hey, man, like, it, it doesn't feel Tio's rushed. Tio's video was done in one day. Tio's was the most rushed project in the entire world. No. I don't, I don't know if you guys know, I spent an entire week trying to figure out why I couldn't edit it on my computer. Like, footage just wasn't working at all. So I'm like, okay, I got a week to edit this. Let's get, let's get it going. Not working. Cool. Let's optimize, optimize, not working. Work with proxies. How to work with proxies, YouTube, YouTube, Google, Google, nothing to the point where I was like, I have to drop money on a new laptop. So I had to buy a new wow. laptop. Still didn't come in time until I hit up TJ and TJ was like, Oh, just go back to premiere pro 2019. I was able to edit it. I got that done. That piece of advice on Friday, like late morning. And I had to like grind that video out from Friday till Friday night, get it uploaded, launched it Saturday morning. So. Wow. <laughs> I love so, that, that you just went out of your way, got a new MacBook to just finish this product. Like that's dedication. But it didn't that even is... come in time. It didn't even come no, in but, time. But you still did it. Like you still <laughs> went to go and do it. And, and it's not even that it happened. It's that you were so committed to getting the goal completed and yeah. getting it done right that you were willing to dump the cash to get it done. Yeah. Because you I also needed a new one. It was the one thing that pushed me over. So, uh, that's yeah, awesome. Coach. Shout out to TJ. He's also in the chat. So, Yes. Thank you, Fuego, for the advice. You saved that project or we would have had to, I would have had to delay the project if I didn't hit up Fuego. So, hmm. awesome. but yeah. Wow. That's so cool, man. I, I think I could ask a ton of questions on GT, but I, I honestly love the mystery and I love what you guys do from, from creating content. Uh, from that perspective and i almost want to leave it there a little bit and and allow the content to speak for itself mm -hmm. and allow you guys to release product and content that just captivates in a different way than a lot of other companies are able to do um i do i think want to rest some time yeah. uh, with you talking about your family your life and what it's like yeah. playing kendama at the age of 37. so i mean I don't know if I actually personally have any experience to be able to ask any leading questions there. So I want to kind of open it to you and say, what is it like for you being someone who grew up in the Kanama world, was a primary innovator in the Kanama world, uh, and still are, to now playing at 37 years of age, emceeing events, traveling, yet raising a family, raising Isla. What yeah. is it like? Um, hold on a second. I'm trying to get camera reset up here. It might be a little tricky. Yeah, we'll get balance. It. Come on. It's like Ken Balance. We're going to be a little sideways now. <laughs> okay. Fun fact I'm using my old laptop as a phone stand. <laughs> hey, awesome. I got to plug in. So, um, yeah, I mean, to me, it's just something that I got into at 25. And I think that a lot of people feel like they need to exit something they enjoy when they grow up or whatnot. Hmm. And I think that it's it's important to hold on to the things that that originally made you happy and constantly be able to revisit that happiness. Um, mm -hmm. So, for instance, like like I grew up playing a lot of music. I still play music. I have a little kalimba. I have a guitar, and I still play that, and I still get joy from it. And uh, I, when I was in middle school and high school, I played with like fingerboards. I'm I still play yeah. with toy skateboards at oh. 37. Those of you and, listening, you've got to check out his clips. Or his <laughs> They're so fun. Stylish, so, too. To me, it's about keep keeping the things that make you happy close to you and, and uh, 
using those to make yourself happy every once in a while and not be pressured from like outside sources telling you like, oh, that's what kids do or whatnot. And, um, and something that, that's been awesome is since starting a family, <laughs> since starting a family, it's really exciting to be able to share those things with my daughter, you know? Hmm. And so we'll like, fingerboard together, teach her how to grind curbs and stuff. And like, we'll run around and I can just be a total goofball and be able to be the dad that plays with well, toys, you know? So it's really exciting to hmm. be able to, to raise a child with this love for toys, you know? So hmm. I'm, I, I can't wait to share Dude, more condom with her. That is the most wholesome thing I've ever heard in my life, I think. <laughs> I love that. Um, how how old is Isla now? Isla's two. She turned two this past Monday. Okay. So she is freshly two years old. And and has she landed her first whirlwind yet? No, she can spike it though. Can she actually? She'll no hold way. The drama and 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 you say Isla spike it and she'll pop. And she'll put it on there. <laughs> oh, so, that's awesome. That's pretty so, awesome. Do you now with her growing up and you raising her? Do you have this this goal in, in trying to teach her these things? And what do you what do you hope she becomes character wise? What kind of a person do you want to raise? Whatever she's gonna be, man. It's like I try not to focus too much on like filling this like having this idea of what she should be yeah. in my head because I don't know. So I just am trying to have as much fun with her and teach her to be as good as she can be. And she will make, she'll form that person that, that she's going to be. Mm. Um, but just like core basics, and you always hope your child is like kind, understanding, loving, and uh, can do whirlwinds first try. Yeah, but, well, that, that's a given. Uh, I mean, other than that, it's, it's like, I'm excited just to see what she becomes, you know? Um, right now, she's two years old, and she's learning how to talk. She's got words now that are working really well we get excited whenever she's done with her food and says all done we're like oh you said all done instead of screaming yes yeah so uh and uh yeah she's just mm. her little personality is developing so fast so i imagine she's probably running around a lot now hey oh god dude you can't you can barely keep keep up with her i i don't know she if doesn't you... walk anywhere she runs yeah, if, if you've ever uh, been on my stories or those that have been followed me for the past like month and a bit, since I moved to Calgary, I've spent a lot of more a lot more time at my sister's house and she's got three kids. She's got a nine year old, a six year old and this two and a half girl, uh, Elisha or Ellie for short. And Ellie is the most stubborn, funny and like strong willed little two and a half year old I've ever met. And she is she is the most fun for me to spend time with. But, it, but it's oh. like that wonderful age of two where they're just learning to form themselves where their attitude is coming out, where you get to see oh, it with their personality. <laughs> oh, it is so fun. That, that's so yeah. cool. And so you guys want one, one kid right now. Say what? Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, and um, something else too is come November, we're going to have another one. Oh, that's so sick. You heard it here first. Yeah, oh, my so goodness. I, I've been keeping it super low key, but yeah, we got a little boy coming in November. So. No way. Congratulations. I was literally going to ask if you were planning on having more kids. <laughs> that was what I was trying Absolutely. to ask. Absolutely. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, so Shout we're out. super excited. I, I'm keeping it super low key. I have to, like, remind, like, we have to remind ourselves that we're having another baby because we're so busy with Isla. But, like, yeah, November. Wow. Congratulations, Jake. Thank that you. is so exciting. Wow. That November, man, that's not that far away. No, we're, like deep in it most people announce their pregnancy is like three months in we're like yeah, 30 like weeks six in months in. <laughs> yeah so um yeah we're, wow. we're super excited and it's gonna it's good dip we're adding to the family and we've got our two we got a little boy a little girl super excited man that that is so cool congratulations are you how do you feel about that where are you excited are you nervous after raising one kid to two years old, what is your, what, where's your head at? Your head's at like, all right, we're going to have to change some things and adapt. But like from, from having the, the first child with Isla, it's like, a, again, you can build up in your mind, like what it's going to be like, what it's going to mm -hmm. be like. It's okay. I need to prepare for this and do that. 
But the second you, you have the kid, you just, it's all gone. You just do it. You just go, you just adapt, you go with it because failure is not an option. You have not even no. a shred, you can't even get a D. You have to pass because you have to keep this thing alive and you have to nurture it, become a good person. And that's your only job. I, I was telling a lot of my other friends about like having kids is like, it's amazing because like you have all these different responsibilities, you know, for like, for me, it's like, all right, there's Kendama and there's uh, house and there's all these different things you have to do. And, but when you have a kid, it all just goes soup, boom, and it goes straight. So everything you do just goes to them and it really mm -hmm. streamlines your priorities and makes it to where it's really easy to make a decision. Like back when it's mm -hmm. like, oh, should I do that? You're like, that does it help my family? Yes, no, 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 yes, mm -hmm. yes. So you just streamlines everything. So with having number two, it's going to be the same thing, but just doubled. Hmm. So, and you just adapt. You just adapt to it when it comes. Absolutely, to you, make it happen. So, you know how, yeah, has fatherhood, in your opinion, made you a better company owner, a better kendama player, just a better human in general? How has that shaped definitely, your life? Definitely a better human in general because you understand a whole different level of society. Before you have kids, you can kind of think about like, oh, well. There's this and that, and I think people should do this with their kids and do that with their kids. And the second you have kids, you then understand. And mm -hmm. you kind of join this, this uh, understanding of having another human that completely depends on you. Mm -hmm. So that I definitely think makes you a different, it adds to your character in mm -hmm. a very, very positive way. Uh, Kandama player, <laughs> I don't think it's really had anything to my Kendama skills. Hasn't taught um, you more patience? Uh, not in Kendama. Okay. Because Kendama, I'm in complete control over it. With sure. a baby, you're not in complete control. They're their own. They're their they got their own. own um, uh, but with creativity and design and photography, it's 100%. Like, I haven't taken okay. as many pictures in God knows how long. Um, <laughs> the idea of... Uh, I mean, they're just your, your, they're your little inspiration. So things that they do will, will carry on into your life and uh, your creative inspiration. And I've, my photography game has definitely gone up. So cool. Cool. Well, Jake, we got eight minutes left and there's a ton of questions that were submitted. Uh, do you want to spend the, the last little bit just quick firing through a few of them? Let's do it. Awesome. Okay. Kevin P. Martin, the owner of Quill Kendama asked, uh, what does it take to organize a team tour? The Euro tour video is so inspiring. Uh, team tour is get the right people on your team. That whole tour was organized by Tio. Mm. Tio is one of the most driven people in the Kendama game. Tio was like, I want to do a Euro tour. I've got all these spots lined up. I was like, all right, here's what we're going to do to make it happen. I worked out everything on my side. Uh, who do we want to go on it? Who can go on it? Got everybody lined up. Tio did everything else. Everything else. Wow. Um, shout out to Tio. Yeah, shout out Tio. And that's one of the things that makes you a professional man is like, it's beyond those tricks. And like Tio's tricks are already next level, but it's that drive and that, and that, yeah. that willpower. It's more than say, just like, the I tricks. I want to make a tour happen. And yeah. you make a whole tour happen. So, and then you yeah. pair that up with, with Damon and Ben Harold, and you have a dream team. And then so me good. and Stodd come in later, where the laggers, they come in later at the Copenhagen stop. And <laughs> you've, got the, you've got the band, man. Band's back together, so. Awesome. Uh, Get the right your team and, and, uh, and, have, and work, with, work with them. Help them open the doors. That's how you make tours happen. Yeah. Uh, Lace and Confused ask, uh, is there a second back, batch of Teo mods coming out? Probably soon, I think is what he's yeah, asking. Oh, yeah. It did definitely. I mean, with all of our USA made products, um, we get them as fast as we can. Um, with the precision that those are made, it can take a little bit more time. So, uh, yeah, we definitely have a schedule and it's going to be rolling out soon. And TO mods are definitely coming back. 100%. We can't make enough. <laughs> awesome. Naran Rajan asks You play with a lot of skill toys besides Kendama. Can you rank all of the skill toys you play with? Maybe give like a top three or four. Like the ones I enjoy playing with? Yeah. Okay, so Kandama number one, and then it would be fingerboarding, then it would be knucklebone, mm. then it would be 
What else? Oh, yo yo, definitely Ooh. in there. Um, and I actually, yeah, I try all the new skill toys. I got the fin gears, the little things, the little rings. You may have seen the ads. Mm, yeah, yeah, and yeah. Those, I'm, I'm still trying to learn those. Not, not as into those, but yeah, those are definitely ones. Kendama, fingerboarding, um, the knuckle bone, and then oh, Bali song. My oh yeah, Bali song. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm super into that. But the ones I'm most most fluent in are kendama and fingerboarding and knuckle bone. Um, I don't know if you've had a chance to watch much of it, but Josh Pilardo, uh, player I believe for Artemis Kendamas, asked uh, thoughts on KWC online so far. I think uh, that you probably have a, a special uh, affinity. Well, I can't even think of the word for it, but affinity for KWC in person because you've emceed it. Oh, I do, and it feels so crazy not to be emceeing yeah. this year. I think I think what they're doing is amazing, and it's giving a lot of people the opportunity to uh, be a part of it. You know, and I I don't know how the heck they're doing it. It's wild. I just saw Coda just went to bed a few hours ago. Wow. So. Uh, big shout outs to all the Glowkin crew, all the KWC crew, the people that make it happen. They are the, some of the hardest working people in Kendama. Mm -hmm. But I'm really excited. To, I I see Nobu and Ryan up there, and I'm like, yeah, oh, God, I just want to be yeah. with them right now and seeing. But uh, it's actually kind of nice to kind of take this year off um, and get back to it whenever it's another physical thing to kind of be that part that mm -hmm. kind of adds a little bit a little bit to it. So cool. I'm, I'm really stoked to see him pushing through with it. All right, let's try and get through four or five more real fast. Uh, Ezra Dama asks, Jake, uh, how's the meat pulling going today? The what? Meat pulling? Meat pulling. Oh, I'm, not, I, I'm actually not pulling anything. I just made some flank steaks the other day. That was Ooh. really nice. And then took those, made some tacos with it. But nice. Yeah, the next thing I'm, I'm wanting to do is definitely some more pineapple steaks, which we can mm. talk about that later. But yeah, pineapple steaks. That's Good. another round. Oh, so good. Uh, Brett Walters asked, uh, how has rollerblading influenced Kendama for you and vice versa? Oh, everything. Everything I do is based off of what I learned from skating. And it's not only the tricks. Like, I want to play Kendama how Dustin Latimer skated. But it's also, I want to, I'm so influenced by, like, Senate, Mind Game, um, classic, like, rise above like all of the old skate brands are some of my main inspirations for what i do with my clothing lines my product designs um ev everything so mm -hmm. skating i uh, i owe everything to eight wheels so cool all right last two questions one from gucci moon boots uh what is mm -hmm. the biggest goal for 2021 2021 biggest goal for 2021 is get my ass back to japan europe i want everyone to be good wear their masks so we can get out of this pandemic and we can go back to mm -hmm. our healthy society of kendama and be able to travel and see each other and play kendama and have these events that really bring us closer and really push the kendama community further so mm -hmm. that's the goal cool and we got one minute 30 goal. seconds left uh drew manchu asked max for gt i imagine he's referring to max angel in canada ottawa area oh yeah dude he's killing it Dude, he's he, absolutely crushing it, And he's man. legendary. He's 10 years he's been playing. His Dude, story's really cool. He has a KG jersey. I saw that. The old KG jersey. The well, classic vintage. And I was like, You just wait what? till September 1st. And then and then there's going to be some coming out, and you'll want to read it. And Max has something hey. to do with it. So a uh, yeah. little teaser there. I'm, I'm watching everybody, and I'm definitely watching Max. So Awesome. Hey, Jake, thank you so much for jumping on the review today. This has been a huge treat for me, a pleasure for, I think, everybody that's been tuning in. We got to nerd out about coffee, nerd out about GT, Absolutely. nerd out about family life as well. I think you gave some really cool insight into to the longevity of playing Kendama and how it shapes our lives outside of just tricks. I think Absolutely. that's wonderful. Uh, thank you. Is there anything that you want to say here at the end before I wrap it up? Uh, yeah, thanks everybody for coming out, checking it out. Thanks everybody for playing Kendama. Thank you for hosting. This, this, this is a really cool uh, way to talk about Kendama. And it's, it's through the love of coffee and all things connoisseur. Awesome. We're all connoisseurs of everything. Coffee, Kendama, everything. So it's really cool to kind of contrast those two together. And thanks. Absolutely. All right, we got 18 seconds. 
the last couple of things, those of you that are tuning in, make sure you share this afterwards so other people can find out about this episode. It's going to be uploaded on Spotify, Apple Music, Google Podcasts, you name it. So make sure you go and share it there as well. And thank you for tuning in.